Welcome to Talking with Tatchell. There's still a year to go before London will vote to elect the mayor of one of the world's greatest cities. Already the parties are limbering up for the contest. But things are not running smoothly. Ken Livingstone has announced that he wants to be Labour's candidate. That's yet to be decided, but I guess he's pretty certain to be their standard bearer. The Lib Dems and the Tories, however, seem to be having great difficulty in selecting any high-profile person to stand against Ken. The Green Party has not been so reticent. They've already selected their candidate, and it's Sean Berry, a noted environmental campaigner in London on London-wide issues. She's now with me to discuss her bid to be the Green Mayor of London. Welcome, Sean. Thank you. I want to start by asking you, um, why should people vote for a Green Mayor for London? Well, why not? That's what I say. Um, we do need a Green Mayor. A Green Mayor would be absolutely fantastic for London. Um, we've got why? at the moment... Well, at the moment we've got um, Ken Livingstone, who is, to a large extent, influenced by the two Greens on the London Assembly. Uh, they have a controlling stake in his, on the vote on his budget. Um, and they've managed to make a large difference to his policy. So there are some green things happening. So this is, this is um... nowhere near enough. Absolutely nothing like enough. Um, things like uh, renewable energy, it's not moving as fast as it should. Public transport is improving, but not as fast as it should. Cycling, people are pouring onto the streets on, on bikes, and the facilities are not catching up with them. There's just not enough for people to uh, get people out on the streets. And what, what, What's your critique of Ken Livingston? Because many people will say, well... He's a left winger, he's progressive, you know, mm. why should you stand against him? Well, he could do better <coughs> on everything. I mean, it's not just the environmental issues, on uh, affordable housing. Um, quite often he just lets developments go through that don't make his targets, the ones he set in the London plan. The average amount of uh, affordable housing in new developments is supposed to be 50%. At the moment he's letting things go through. The average is 31% affordable housing. And that's just not providing the housing we need in London. Um, so there is a lot that can be done um, that he isn't doing. And I think as well as uh, providing a strong green challenge and... Uh, you know, pushing, pushing him in that direction. I think, actually, we could uh, do with a winner. I think we could do with a green mayor for London, and that would make all the difference. What do you feel about his attempt to woo business? I mean, it's not a traditional left or green agenda, and I know that quite a lot of progressive people feel, you know, they sort of understand that you have to do deals with business, but they've got some concerns that he's been rather too generous to business interests. Yeah, I think that's, that's true. I mean, as he started out, like you say, as a Red Ken, champion of the people, um, and now as time has gone on, he's got more and more cosy with big business. And it's, and it's understandable. He's spent a lot of time uh, working with them on big developments and big projects, and he's wowed by these lovely models, and, and he wants to see these things happen. And, and it just seems to me like he's a little bit too cosy with them uh, in some respects. Um, the one thing I've been working on quite a lot is the King's Cross development, which is right in the heart of Camden, which is the borough where I live. Um, we are desperate for social housing. And yet, the, borough, the, the development that's gone through, that the borough's approved and that went to Ken Livingstone for approval and that he approved, has got less than the target amount of social housing in it. It's predominantly office blocks. It's designed to attract commuters in from Kent. It isn't really going to help the local community as much as it should. They're knocking down buildings that are perfectly good social housing buildings in order to create space to put in these office power blocks and things. Um, it's basically a business friendly development and, and I really don't like the way um, Ken Livingston is very, very cosy with the developers there. Um, he's wowed by the billion pound project. He's not really thinking about what the people in one of the most deprived areas of London actually need, which is jobs and housing that will suit the local area and make us a, a self-sustaining local economy. Yeah, and what's your view about his proposals for these big, grand, high-rise buildings? Well, again, I think he's, you know, he's being wowed by the, by the price tag and by the shininess of the project. Um, I don't think a big tower block is what we need on the, on the South Bank there. Um, and You're talking about the, sh the, the one shard of glass, yeah. whatever it's called. That's, that's, uh, you know, this is I, a London Bridge. Yeah, yeah, it's London Bridge. Um, I, I don't think that's exactly what we need there. I think, again, we need more social housing. We need to make, make the city restructured in a way that isn't just about its skyline, that's actually about 
ordinary people's lives, people being able to live close to where they work. It's, uh, it's one of those things that, that I, don't, I think he's slightly lost sight of as, as time has gone on. He wants to make his mark on London, create these big landmarks. And, and that's not really what being the a mayor of, of London should be about. A bit of the Mitterrand about him, yeah. Possibly, yeah. <laughs> um, I, mean, yeah I mean, I'm surprised that, you know, with these big you know, skyscrapers and so on that he's, he's backing and supporting, mm. that he hasn't built in a much bigger planning gain dimension mm. in terms of including social housing within the development, including open space. I know, I know there's some, some but it, it seems to be very marginal, very mm. fragmented, and not part of a really cohesive policy. Is, is that your perspective? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's got the London plan. The London plan says 50% of affordable housing. The London plan says 10% renewable energy. But time and again, he lets the big developments go through that don't meet those targets. And quite often, the um, excuse, the reason the developer gives is um, it's what makes the development commercially viable. And I don't buy that. I really don't. I mean, they, for one thing, we can't see the figures. They're commercially sensitive. The planning authorities get to see them and then pass on the details to the local councillors who are then told, no, it's honestly, it's true, but you can't see the details. And I just, I just don't buy it. I think there's a lot more we could get out of um, in terms of planning gain, like you say, from these big developments. There's such a premium. Lond London is such a place to develop. I think they'd come anyway, even if we did ask them for more than we're currently getting. I think he's not firm enough with them, and there's more he could get. In terms of affordable housing, mm -hmm. um, I think you know, most Londoners across the board would agree that this is a very important you know, and absolutely vital issue. You know, most people nowadays cannot afford uh, new housing because if they're not, if they're not already an owner, um, their chances of becoming a, an owner of, of housing uh, is almost zero unless they're extremely well off. Yeah. I mean, what is your view about how that new affordable housing dimension is going to be funded? Well, I think it, it, sh I mean, I think it should come out of um, investment normal investment. I just think we have to put better conditions on it. Um, people will be able to make a profit building in London, even if we enforce these targets. Um, and the fact of the matter is there are now 35,000 fewer social rented homes in London, and we need to see more of them. I think it would be very sensible for the mayor to look at some of the sites that are available to say, we will have this, this site must be 60%, 80% social rented housing. Um, developers, what proposals do you have that, that would create that? And leave it open for them to bid for. If they think they can't make a profit, then they won't bid. But I truly believe that there are developers out there who would see that as a, an opportunity to invest. And yeah, well, where, where, they where might would get lower profit margins, but I think they're acceptable. I think you know, you'd get a guaranteed return and people would invest in them on those terms. You just need to set the terms more firmly. What, what kind of places or sites would you see? Because obviously land is at a premium in London, mm -hmm. where would this new social housing be? Well, there are a lot of brownfield sites that are available, and I'm not talking about back gardens here. <laughs> there are lots of, um, you know, in between um, old scrapyardy type places and in between sites that aren't actually being counted by councils, by local boroughs, um, in their inventories of what space there is available. So there are lots of smaller sites that can be used to create these things. And on t in terms of bigger sites, there is, I mean, there's the King's Cross development, which is the largest brownfield site in Europe. We could put twice as many social houses on it as we have done um, without a problem. How many social houses are there now? Um, the at the, the moment, there's, there's going to be, um, oh, I can't, number of units is tricky, but um, it's going to be less than 40% mm -hmm. um, of the units are going to be affordable rented, affordable or rented housing. Um, and it could be, you know, 60 or 80%, and I think it would be fine. There's other places like car parks. I was astounded. I took a different route on a train through London than I normally do the other day um, and went past so many large car parks next to um, big shopping developments. And I, I was under the impression that these weren't prevalent in London. I thought, you know, um, these were things for out of town. But there are not. There are, lo there are huge swathes of land that are just being used to park cars. I think there's a huge opportunity to do something about that, to reduce the amount of car parking there is that goes with these retail developments, um, build on them, build, build rented housing on them, um, and, and reconfigure the way that 
retail works. There's and no place for these big out-of-town type stores within London. We should have, all have local shops that we can reach by walking or cycling. And even in central London, there's lots of car parking space. And mm. if we want to keep cars out of central London and, and reclaim the streets for mm. pedestrians and to, to make a more convivial atmosphere, perhaps they could be converted as well. I think, yeah, a gradual reduction. I mean, they're doing it, they're doing it within um, schools at the moment. A lot of uh, councils are reducing the car parking permits for people driving their children to school in an attempt to get parents to um, use different methods. And that's actually been quite effective. They, they say to people, we're going to reduce this by 10% a year, year on year, and eventually we're going to phase them out. So you're going to have to find other ways of getting your children to school. And people are objecting to it, but they are coping with it. And you could do the same with, with car parking spaces. Mm. There are you know, probably hundreds of thousands of them in the centre of London. If you said, we want to discourage car use, let's phase them out, why not? Yeah. You, you've emphasised quite a lot new social housing as part of mm. you know, planning gain within big you know, office developments and other, other commercial mm. developments. Um, what about straightforward funding of social housing by local authorities? Um, you know, new council house building is almost zero. It has been for you know, two decades. Um, that, I suppose, is another option, together with you know, social landlords and, and housing associations. I mean, how would you propose to fund that kind of affordable housing? Well, I think the government should be paying for that. I think um, it's one of those things that they are currently doing is, is trying to privatise council. Housing. They're trying to take the social housing that councils currently own and push them into arm's length management organisations. I'm completely against that. I think they should be preserved within the councils. Council house sales should cease and new building should be encouraged. So um, the government owes my borough again, Camden, nearly £300 million because we voted against an Almo. So now our houses are not being refurbished, we're not getting any new builds. Um, or because the government's just withholding this money because we've insisted we want the fourth option of direct funding. So this is clear. This is, this is vindictive, vengeful <laughs> government policy to penalise local authorities like Camden who won't hand over their housing stock to arm's length management organisations. Well, the council did what the government told them to do, which was to hold a ballot. Um, so they held a ballot. They gave the... Uh, um, residents the options of you know an Almo full stop transfer or um, neither and they voted for neither they said no we want to keep our housing stock managed within the council that's who we want to be our landlords um, and that apparently was, the answer was not acceptable the answer the residents of Camden gave was not acceptable to the government so yeah they're being vindictive they're withholding improvements we have to live with dodgy bathrooms now so let's be clear Gordon Brown the Chancellor the likely future Prime Minister, mm -hmm. is directly responsible for starving local authorities of the funds they need and deserve for new social housing. Yeah, That's Labour's agenda. That is their Crush agenda. the poor. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, <laughs> That's what they want to see. They want to, yeah, exactly. Yeah. They, 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 are, they don't support social housing. That's not what they want to see. They want to phase it out. And, and Ken Livingston is a part of that party. He, he, he is going to be the official candidate of the party that wants to deny local authorities the right to have a choice over whether they have social housing or other forms of housing, and if they vote the wrong way, if they don't agree to the government's plans, Ken Livingston's party is going to say, I'm sorry, no more funding. I think that's a really, really good point. People do forget that Ken Livingston is a member of the Labour Party. He wasn't when he was first elected, he was an independent. And he's gone back and he's rejoined that party. And, and I think that's something people do need to hold against him. Um, he, may, he may try and, he probably will, run his campaign as, oh, I'm, I'm just, you know, old Ken, the person that you all know and love. But actually, he is going to be the Labour Party's candidate, and you've got to be holding him responsible for the policies of the Labour Party. Yeah, I mean, we all know that he opposed the Iraq war to his credit, mm. but he is part of a party that prosecuted that war and covered up and lied and deceived the people. Um, you know, I was in the Labour Party and I left because I couldn't stand being part of a party that was so dishonourable. Yeah, and but he went Kenna's, back and with it. He went and rejoined them after, the, after they did that. Yeah. Which, um, I, you know, people do need to remember that that's what he's done. Can we just shift on some of the other policies? Um, mm -hmm. For example, public transport is obviously very crucial in London. You know, what's mm -hmm. the Greens' agenda on, on, on public transport? Um, it needs improving. Um, yeah, well, uh, QED. <laughs> it's, it's better than it was, but there are still many bus routes that aren't sensible. The tube doesn't run as well as it should. Um, we need to see more investment in new things like trams. Um, we also need to see walking and cycling 
um, promoted much more than they are. It isn't a, a pedestrian-friendly city yet, London. I think there's a lot more we can do to uh, improve things for pedestrians. Um, certainly, Jenny Jones has been talking lately about abolishing the gyratory systems, which is absolutely proven that one-way systems are just incredibly bad for pedestrians. Cars go much faster. They don't look out for people. Um, they are you know, accident black spots, largely. Um, bringing things back into two-way traffic, pedestrianising some streets, which you get a bit, of a bit of a bonus and opportunity to do that when you abolish the gyratories, is an absolutely brilliant idea, and I'm definitely going to be promoting that. Public transport. Um, the fares are too high, and everyone says so. Um, it's the, the cash fares you have to pay are absolutely ludicrous. And the dodgy marketing that's going on at the moment about the Oyster card saying it's half price with Oyster, when actually they put up the, the normal price so much that the having paying half as much on Oyster is still a lot of money. It's still two pounds, two pounds fifty to catch the tube. Around. It's the most expensive it's public transport system in the world. Yeah. Um, I see and that. again, Ken Livingston's presided over it. He's but the architect of this mm. policy. Yeah, and I don't see why ordinary commuters have to be paying for um, the improvements that we need to public transport. It's something the government ought to be doing because it's in everyone's interest to have a decent public transport system. And you can't squeeze it out of people. I, I have an Oyster card, I do use Oyster, and I still spend an absolute fortune using public transport every week. Um, it's, you know, it's a significant chunk of, of what I have to pay out. and it's. It's wrong. We shouldn't be having to um, suffer these high fares. We should make sure that they are cut. And that's something the Green Party... It, it is very on. symptomatic of the lack of joined-up thinking by Labour. Mm. You know, on the one hand, they're saying they want to cut greenhouse gases and mm. uh, tackle climate change, and they recognise we need to reduce car usage, but they're giving no incentives to people to use public transport because no. it's so expensive. I mean, running a car is expensive, but on a journey-by-journey -journey basis, if you've got the choice of using some petrol or getting the bus, if you, especially if you don't catch public transport all that, all that often, driving your car is far cheaper than catching the bus, and that is wrong. You have to make the greenest option the cheapest option. So catching the bus ought to be much cheaper than the, the cost of running the petrol on that particular journey. People don't take into account the fact their car costs them money and they have to pay the insurance when they're making that split-second decision about how to make the, the journey they need to make. And how would you fund the reduction fares? Um, well, there's plenty we can do. I mean, I'm, on a national basis, we're campaigning for um, more investment in buses from national government. So we'd hopefully be able to pull some more money in that way. Um, we'd like to see petrol taxes increased, for example, on a national basis. So there's, as a there's money to be... As a disincentive to drive. Partly as yeah, that, yeah. And, and, and in order to raise money to improve public transport as well. Um, mm -hmm. So, those so you, you, you'd, you'd tag that increase in petrol prices to directly to funding local public transport? Yeah, the money, the money I mean, not, not perhaps the actual pound coins themselves, but yeah, the money we would raise from green taxes would absolutely be spent on measures to enable people to do the green option. You have to do that, otherwise what you do is with your green taxes is you hit the poor hardest. So just taxing petrol would be wrong if you don't spend the money and isn't on that improving Labour's, buses. Isn't that Labour's big flaw? They talk green, they have mm. introduced these green taxes, but mm. the money just disappears into the exchequer. Yeah. It doesn't actually go to funding safe, clean, cheap public transport. No, absolutely not. They're giving, they're giving green taxes a bad name with what they're doing at the moment. Um, you have to be investing in the public transport alternatives. Otherwise, it's just taxes, you know, green taxes. You've got to make it, you've got to use the money to put, push people in a green direction and make it much easier for them to. And what about big projects that you could perhaps cancel or rearrange to? help get, get some big money yeah. to, to fund reduced fares and better public transport? Well, the, the big one, the, the massive inconsistency in Ken Livingstone's policy at the moment is the Thames Gateway Bridge development. That's a six-lane highway across the Thames in East London. It's going to generate 20 million journeys, uh, car journeys a year. It's an absolute white elephant. It's going to cost half a billion pounds, and we'd cut that straight away. Um, and nationally, that's part so, of So you, you'd, you'd put that half a billion pounds for the Thames Gateway Bridge into other public transport projects around London. Absolutely, absolutely. That's that's the kind. Of, I mean, that's what we do. That's the kinds of things that we spend that money on: better buses, um, new trams, uh, improvements to the tube, all of those things that people need to see, and lower fares so that people use them more as well. Um, and what about those who say, "Well, this gateway bridge is needed to revive East London and to link north south." 
It's, it's an absolute myth that it's going to revive the areas it goes in and out of. What it is, it's just a big bypass past those areas. It's just going to enable people to drive faster past the areas that are um, deprived and not actually generate any income for them at all. Um, and in addition to that, it's going to increase their pollution, <laughs> their noise, all the kinds of you know, problems that traffic brings. That's what they're going to suffer from. And it won't, they won't gain at all from it. The people in those areas are opposed to the bridge. What about the Thames River itself? I think it's the great unused highway of London. Mm. You know, um, when I stood as a Green Left candidate for the London Assembly in 2000, one of my policies was to make the River Thames the, quote, 14th tube line, oh. to, to, to get rid of this system of private operators doing river boats, mm. to establish you know, high-speed um, hydrofoils or hovercraft publicly funded, invested on the scale that you would invest in the tube to, to get commuters using that river as a way as to relieving the pressure on the tubes and buses. I mean, what, what's your view about that? That's a fantastic idea. I love it, yeah. I, I mean, I've, to be honest, I've not really thought about it that much, to be honest. But, um, yeah, that sounds absolutely great. I mean, the, 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 <laughs> the big argument... We need to talk about how, this, how we could do this, because that's... Uh, that would be marvellous. You, I mean, do, you do see the odd tourist boat, and that's about it, isn't it? It should be like a tube line, you know, with, 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 with you know, river buses every 10 minutes, you know, from, from 6 a.m. till 9 or 10 p.m. at night. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the problem is Transport for London, they're incredibly conservative about this. They're, they want to operate the river, you know, through all these systems of private owners and contractors, and mm -hmm. that ain't going to work. You need massive investment to establish a really efficient, fast, safe, clean system which is interchangeable with oyster cards and with the stops interchangeable with tube stations and, and major points in central London. I'm sure if that was done, you know, we would get a lot of people using that system. People would love it. The views are amazing. And I bet it's cheap as well. I mean, you've got the river there. You don't need to, compare with, say, a tram line, you don't need to put in a lot of um, track infrastructure. You just no need the road vehicles. maintenance. Just the vehicles is all you need to buy, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's so, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that another idea. time. That's a great idea. We'll go into that in more detail later. Yeah. Um, can I also <laughs> ask you about the Olympics? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think all of us would say it would be great for Britain, and particularly London, to host the Olympics and to have a great success. But we know that you know, this country has a very sad, or this government has a very poor record in hosting mega events. And I must say, as much as I want the Olympics to succeed, I really fear that they are going to succeed, but at a terrible price to, to, to the country in London. We're going to be saddled with debt for generations to come. Um, what, what's your view about that? I mean, I'm kind of like you. I, I quite like the idea of hosting the Olympics. I think it would be nice. I don't want it to bankrupt London. And I do think if we're going to have it, we need to make sure it has legacy effects. I need, we need to make sure that it serves to increase the skills of Londoners, to provide more housing, to be a flagship green event as well, to be put in infrastructure that's zero carbon, to show what can be done. There's things like that that will bring real long-term benefits for London. But there's a danger that the costs are spiraling out, spiraling out of control, for one thing. It's currently running about £9 billion. That's half a billion pounds per day to run <laughs> which just boggles my mind. Um, and Half a billion pounds a day to run the Olympics. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah there's yeah. so much money. Um, so I think there is, there is a danger. We're going to squander the money on um, things that aren't sustainable, aren't long-term and sustainable, um, and that we aren't going to see the environmental skills, jobs, benefits that we could see. They will be the first things to go when things start to be cut. Um, as we saw with Athens Olympics, where they abandoned all their environmental aims. And we're already seeing it with the Olympics. I mean, they started out with um, plans to use local organic food. Um, and then they've decided to have McDonald's as the official sp food sponsor. So now we're trying to get the Olympic Development Authority to um, discuss with McDonald's how they're going to provide local organic <laughs> food with minimal packaging. Um, which is a little bit of a, a, a farce. The, I mean, um, it strikes me as an extraordinary decision to give the franchise to McDonald's. Yes, and it's, and it's not, the thing about that is it's not actually the decision of London who made the bid and said, we're going to do all this to appoint McDonald's. It was the International Olympic Committee who procured them as sponsors. And now we have to work with them to try and get them to fulfil the promises we made in making the bid. So it's all a bit crazy. Um, the Athletes' Village is the other thing. It was supposed to be zero carbon. Um, self-sufficient in energy, and already the plans for that are down to something like 2%. So 
renewable energy. 2%? Which is, which is below... It's pathetic. It's nothing. I mean, the London plan says it has to be 10%. And it's not even, you know, going to make that standard. And London plan's going to, going to increase to 20% fairly soon. It, what's that all about? How do you get away with saying, oh, no, 2% now? I think that's completely wrong. I don't agree with those who say that, you know, the Olympics are just an ego prestige project for Tony Blair and Ken Livingston. I mean, they may be a little bit to that, but I think, I think generally they, they, they sincerely want, you know, London and, and Britain to, to benefit from this project. But I just think they haven't thought through the maths. And I remember when the Olympic bid <laughs> was put in, I, I said, criticised it, saying it's going to be at least twice that. Now it's almost four times that. And, you know, it's, it, that's just a, a year and a bit of past. Mm. Um, I mean, you know, who is going to pay for this in the long term? You know, Ken Livingston's assuring us that Londoners won't pay. But, you know, who is going to pay? Mm. I mean, you know, so far the government has said they will underwrite the extra costs, but of course at the expense of ripping money out of the lottery, which means that, you know, arts, you know, and, and other cultural events, community groups are all going to suffer in, in lots of different ways. You know, initially small amounts, but in the long term much bigger amounts. And I just think it's wrong that, you know, lottery money, which is supposed to be for good causes, is being snitched for the multi-billion pound Olympics. Yeah, I and absolutely the, and the, agree. Uh, grassroots communities are going to lose. And, you know, the argument that, you know, the Olympics is a way to regenerate East London, I mean, that's a nonsense. I agree East London needs to be regenerated, but we don't need the Olympics to do it. And, in fact, the Olympics will actually distort the regeneration project. Yeah. I mean, is that your... I couldn't, couldn't agree more with all of that, I think, is the answer. Um, yeah, I mean, people I know who work in the arts are, are terrified. They're terrified there's going to be huge cuts. To well, we know there are going through, to be huge cuts. The, they, they think they're going to lose their jobs. Um, and that's just absolutely wrong. We shouldn't be taking the money out of the lottery. Um, Ken Livingston has been quite clear so far that we're not going to take any more money from London through the council tax. But we've already put in, I think, an extra £300 million than we said we would in the first place. So you can see that that's probably, promise is probably going to be broken in the future as well. So, so that, that, that money's already been taken from other parts of the Greater London Authority's expenditure? Yeah, somewhere it's come out of, yeah. So, you know, I, I think... That could have end, been money, that 300 million could have been spent on social housing, could have been spe spent on improving air quality so that our kids don't live in an asthma-inducing, you know, polluted environment. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. All that, all, I mean, that money has come from somewhere, so... There'll be more to come. I absolutely believe that. But what, the other thing I want to make sure of, though, is if costs are going up, that the things that go aren't those important things, the legacy, the skills, the living wage, which they promise that they're already backtracking on for the people who work at the Olympics, and the green commitments. If we're going to spend all this money building new infrastructure, it's going to last 100 years. We need to have cut our carbon dioxide by 90% by the, time, by the end of the lifetime of these buildings. We should be making them zero carbon now. And I think... There is no excuse for building second-rate buildings. Well, it sounds that already on the London Olympics, Ken Livingstone, the current mayor who wants to be re-elected, has already reneged and rode back on previous pledges. A, a lot of commitments that he made are not being honoured. Um, it's a not a very good omen. No, it isn't. And it's, I'm, you know, it's, a huge, it's a huge project. It's going to um, affect everything about London. And I think yeah, he has already gone back further than he should have done on, on the promises he made. Okay, Sean, well, thank you very much. I, I, I'm delighted that you've been with us, and I, I'm very pleased that you are setting out a fresh green agenda for London. I think you've got clearly distinctive, vibrant policies, different from all the other parties, and I hope that people will look seriously at the green agenda for the future of London. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. And join us, please, next week for another edition of Talking with Tatchell.